the honor to introduce uh, Matt Emerton, who will be speaking on the counting points of Bungie. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction and the invitation to speak. So I'm talking, well, what I'm talking about is basically speech, but people said that I prepared, but I hope it's the appropriate thing. So, uh, so what I want to um, sort of uh, explain is roughly counting uh, counting for the few points of some bungee of x via the Lachette's base formula on Kamal. And so uh, so that's so I think um so hopefully that's the correct topic. So but that's my understanding is that uh, when one proves the Tamagawa number one conjecture in the function field case, the strategy that uh, Dennis and Jacob pursue is to uh, sort of basically equate uh, sort of each side of the formula with a kind of a homological trace computation. And uh, and I, my sense is that most of the focus of the uh, kind of discussion has been, say, the focus of Blurry's lectures, which is the um, kind of product aspect. But then there's another aspect where you have to identify homological traits and show it kind of counts the points. And uh, Lori makes short shift of this in his lectures, and sort of near the end of lecture three, he just sketches uh, how this is done. It's something more classical that goes back to Kai Barrett's thesis. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. And so, so I'm maybe uh, so a good thing to kind of remember is that if uh, if x over f two is right, then uh, We can count the FQ points of X by a dimension B as a sum over the trace of uh, FQ, basic Cremanius, on by. Homology, uh, so we can homology of the two bar, and of course we have a beautiful sign. So that's the, that's the um kind of uh Bayes conjecture left and straight formula, which I guess is the theorem of uh, growth in DKNP school. And just to, I'm not sure everyone here knows it very well, but just to remind you that sort of the way the story goes is um, the way kind of Bayes thinking at least went, is that uh, we think of uh, X over FQ bar as so the geometric object. And so X over FQ bar has this endomorphism uh, FQ, which so uh, X is a right, so to say locally affine. So any particular point has some affine neighborhood where there may be some coordinate X1 to X n. And you map these X1 to the Q, X n to the Q. And that will preserve X because uh, in this affine neighborhood, of course, this affine neighborhood of a point in X may not be in affine space, it's some affine variety in affine space, but it's going to be an affine variety with equations over FQ because X is defined over FQ. And so this uh, so this um, operation is going to preserve zeros of equations defined over FQ. And so it will give you an endomorphism of X. And the fixed points are. And the uh, 
exactly points of x applied over the finite field FQ just from kind of Kumar's simple theorem and its composition. And so uh, and so then if you imagine there's a cohomology theory of some reasonable type, but now there's a singular cohomology of uh, of sort of compact manifolds, then you can um, imagine that you can count the points by a electric trace formula, and that's what's true. Now, when you do a electric trace formula, there are certainly kind of subtleties because you have to count points with correct model for cities. And so, um, so, so there's a kind of a, a useful fact. I mean, we're not going to dwell on that in this talk, so maybe I can do it over here. But if you kind of look at the, um, you look at this equation, you differentiate the text for your over FP, you get kind of one, which is not zero. And so, uh, and so this equation, so, so counting a few points, so sort of this phenomenon shows you that sort of the, um, I mean, more geometrically, you're sort of intersecting like the graph of Cabanius with, with the graph of the identity of the diagonal, and you're trying to see whether those intersections are transverse or if they're not, you have to keep worried about our implicit intersection, and this computation tells you that the intersections are always transverse. And so you never have to um, worry about, uh, you don't have to worry about multiplicity. So that's why they're not multiplicities in this formula. And of course, there are famous examples of this formula that certainly they studied in order to make the conjecture. So, I mean, again, as we just have other historical remarks related to how, how they found the conjecture. So one of them is that uh, you know, these cohomologies uh, you conjectured and once they were found, in fact, I like singular cohomology of compact metaphors that they find a dimensional sort of Fabanius acts by some eigenvalues. And so you can compute these. Uh, so, so there's some eigenvalues that are kind of going into a formula here. But that has an interesting consequence. For example, that if you go from FQ to FQ to the N, the F, the F sub Q to the N will be FQ to the nth power. So the eigenvalues will have to be raised to the nth power. And so the formula for the FQ to the N points will depend on those same eigenvalues. So there's kind of a finite amount of data telling you the kind of points over an infinite increasing collection of fields. So that was kind of regarded as interesting and maybe not obvious, not necessarily expected. And so investigating that was kind of one of the things that they did to uh, to be this formula. In fact, generally what they did is he looked at this is a new cycle side to kind of try and verify this formula. Because he essentially used the fact that, for example, in for elliptic curves, if you lift an elliptic curve and catch the P to a CM elliptic curve, Cabanius could lift to a CM. And then you could use the singular cohomology of the lift with the CM acting on it as a proxy for this formula. And so they essentially did this, but not only for the curves, but for uh, basically for my hypersurfaces, which are also related to CM and Billiam dryness. And so essentially they sort of studied the formula in CM cases where you had, you sort of had uh, proxies, where you could use cohomology to zero and, and uh, and think, things are there, but then you can kind of reconvert that information to other like uh, algebraic number theory information about CM fields, and so kind of do Gauss subs and so on, which is what one finds in his papers. But essentially, all the Gauss subs and so on that appear in these papers are more or less the, the big picture of what they were able to do was in some rather small collection of cases, one can kind of lift the situation of this FQ to that just consider But it's but a general comment to make, which is kind of, I think, what the dwell on is that. This formula, for example, makes sense on that fine space or project your space in, in characteristic zero, but this endomorphism typically will not preserve any interesting sub varieties of that fine space or projective space in characteristic zero. So the fact that it preserves sub varieties, that's the special feature of being in characteristic zero. Um, so another way to say is varieties in characteristic P just automatically tend to be CM in a way that varieties in characteristic zero don't. So um, so they look at kind of various formulas, I mean, various cases of this. For example, uh, maybe I'm going to say PN 
minus one. But so, um, and one way to uh, compute this is just to say, well, you have to look at uh, the non-zero points in an n-dimensional space and then push it out by scaling. And so that gives you two to the n minus one, two minus one is the answer. But but they also made the following observation that this can be written as this geometric series. And that's kind of interesting because uh, because Pn minus one is sort of, so let's sort of say now, well, let, let's think about it two ways. So let's just say Pn minus one is literally equal to an n minus one space is going to be well, there's now Pn minus two at infinity, which has an n minus two backline space, which itself has a Pn minus three at infinity and, and so on. And so uh, counting these points, you can see you're counting the points here, the points here, the, and the points here. So that's sort of an interesting observation. Um, but it sort of suggests, but one also recognizes that sort of CP and minus one is so complexly, this will be two n dimensional. So it's a sort of a two n minus one cell, then glued to a to a minus two cell, and so on, down to a zero cell. And this is the cohomology. CP minus one is uh, U in degree two and minus one, then Q in degree two and minus two, and so on down to a Q in degree two, and a Q in degree zero. And so, so if you kind of imagine there's a kind of homological formula, things start to match nicely. For example, the uh, all the homologies in even degrees, and so the signs uh, go away, and uh, and you have the right number of sum ends to be coming from the, the sort of, so here you have the right number of sum ends to be kind of coming from cohomology. And one thing you have to understand is uh, how your, um, you have to understand how uh, the FQ might act, um, how might it act on these classes. So what traces would we expect? Well, we kind of know what the traces are supposed to be because we're looking at this formula and we're trying to match this formula with the left -hand formula, but we could try to kind of make a reasoning as to like a method, you know, philosophical reasoning as to why that was a reasonable thing to do. And what we might see is that uh, the class, the H2 in the vector space is essentially coming from the fundamental class of CP1. And the Q power map is a degree Q map from the two speed to itself. And so it will act by Q on, uh, on the fundamental class of CP1. And, and maybe that's why we would expect the Q here. And then, and then there's kind of a product structure that gives us the other classes, and that's maybe why we would then expect to get these high powers of Q. And so that all looks very nice. And so that's sort of a, a very a modest but uh, interesting kind of example. There's, a, there's of course, another little subtlety, which is um, here minus one is this quotient. It doesn't make it completely obvious that the FQ points of the quotient are the quotient of the FQ points. So uh, we could look at examples of uh, double covers. So, so, so an interesting exercise that you've never done it to think about how these things go is you could think about GM mapping to GM by, say, let's say we have uncharacteristic, we'll get GM mapping to GM by square. And then you can count the points upstairs and downstairs. Well, it's the same GM, so you get the same answer. But you can think about how the count compares because you have Q minus one rational points downstairs, and above each of them, there'll be two points upstairs. But there's also Q minus one rational points upstairs because it's the same GM. So not two Q minus one. So you have to kind of think about where the, how the points are working out. And you kind of see that, of course, sometimes upstairs, there'll be, you might have a point downstairs as a square, and upstairs, it'll have two square roots, so there'll be a few rational points. But you might have a point downstairs that's not a square, and then upstairs, there'll be no points above it that is quite over FQ. 
that will only be defined over FQ squared. And so, so in fact, and then you kind of realize that what you will need for everything to balance out is you'll need like half the numbers in FQ star to be squares and half not. And luckily we know that's true. But so, um, but you could also think about the interaction of the FQ and the FQ squared count, because now sort of the FQ count and the FQ squared count influence each other in, in this picture. So you can kind of think about how the point counting interacts with regard to, um, say, morphisms of gravity. And here we have a very simple case where we're just including certain varieties into P and minus one. And then we see point counting interaction in a very, very simple way. That if you have, I mean, the sort of, the, the sort of simplest case of, of that kind of stratification will be just to imagine you had Y closed in X, and then you had U, which was the open complement. And then obviously, X of FQ found the points. Q plus the number of points in Y. And so one could ask, how does it interact with the electric exchange perspective on making these counts? And, um, and it's a very interesting question to ask. And in general, it kind of is, it's a, um, at least a kind of a special case of what's a pretty general kind of meta phenomenon in that studying this kind of point counting, with all these left checks approach to counting points naturally leads you to think about uh, kind of chromological phenomena that are kind of lifting more obvious like combinatorial phenomena. And I would say that the kind of general like idea of chief of, you know, turning sort of, uh, I don't know, in geometric blends where one turns point counts into sheaves and then categorification, all of these ideas are kind of taking, uh, of, uh, you know, they come up in kind of geometric blends adjacent subjects of sort of taking a certain concept and then lifting up to some higher, more verified level. One kind of can begin that, and one sees that in growth in Dick's school, just already in trying to think about how to interpret uh, obvious combinatorial maneuvers in point counts. So not even as complicated as a double cover of GM by GM, but just breaking and set up a space up into two pieces. How does that relate to a chromological perspective? And the first thing one sees is that if X is projective and smooth, say, and then Y is smooth and projective, U will be smooth but not projective. And so to kind of already kind of compare these things by point counting, one might need a way to um to count points on a uh, on an open uh, right. And one can do that. And so essentially, we have to use cohomology with complex blocks. And then, if you compute cohomology on cohomology with complex blocks, we if you use the same formula for cohomology with complex blocks, so it makes no difference in the projective case, but in the open case, that kind of counts the correct points. And um, so, for uh, the not necessarily proper varieties. You above, we have the number of points will be the sum zero to q, like the i equates of q, on the compact with supported homology. And uh, sort of some sort of basic input that does this is if we call this J and I call this I. Sort of that sequence of sheaves on X. And 
So I have the constant sheaf QL of X, and the cohomology of that will be the cohomology of that. And then I have the constant sheaf, but along Y, the cohomology of that will be giving the point count for Y, kind of like this point formula. But there's a map where we sort of take stalks at points on X and we map them to the stalks of points on Y, and the kernel is all the stalks on U. So that's the kind of that's the, the QL on U extended by zero to X. And so if we think about sort of so you know this left shift shape formula is like a um this expression is like an Euler characteristic, it's sort of additive in sort of down sequences. And so we see that the point count on U, if we know the kind of the, the formula for the point counts on X and Y, then we see the point count on U will be governed by computing uh the cohomology of this guy. But that's compact, that's one way you can define compactly supported cohomology. And so we see that you kind of, uh, if you want to extend the formula to uh, to open things, and if the formula is going to satisfy this basic reality check that points either lie in U or they don't, you have to use compactly supported cohomology. So, so that's a kind of a that's a a thing that um, you want to do. So just an example there would be maybe we can just sort of. See, example would be if you do A1, then what you not see was A1C0 and H2C is too well, just about minus one. So, uh, so it's maybe just helpful to remember that. Uh, the, the notation twisting by one means the cyclotomic character. The, cyclo the cyclotomic character means uh, the way that you act on roots of unity. And so the, the, the Gawa element in Gawa, in Gawa FQ bar over FQ, the Fabianus element in that Gawa group, that thing raises all numbers to the fifth power. In particular, it raises root of unity to the cube power. So the supernomic character sends that Frobenius Galois to uh, sends it to cube. Now we're not using that, we're using this F cube. So this is like a thing that kind of can be a little bit confusing, but it's important sort of sometimes to be careful about. Is this 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 on, on this uh on this scheme next to F cube bar? It has two different probabilities you can actually think about. After all, it's base change from FQ to FQ bar. So the Gala element that acts on FQ bar over FQ, that acts on this X over FQ bar. That's not a gene, that's not a morphism of varieties. That's the thing that's leaving the variables alone, it's changing the coefficients. Then you have this thing, which is leaving the coefficients alone, but changing the variables. So this is what people sometimes call the geometric probabilities or the probabilities and the morphism. Now, if you compose those two things, the one that changes the coefficients of the cube power and this thing, that just raises everything in the affine rings to the cube power. So that's a morphism which is just uh, raising everything to the cube power to um, essentially topologically variance of atop homology. So it's told you that that acts identically on the atop homology. And so it means that this guy is acting by the Inverse of the Galois Fabianus. So this is also why sometimes purely in Galois theory, people call the inverse of the Galois Fabianus. They also call that the geometric Fabianus. So um, so for the so that's so again as an aside, like if you're doing number fields, I mean, so we're doing varieties over Q or something, and you can look at the Galois homology, the Atoll homology over Q bar, and it will be unramified at most primes, and so you can act like Fabianus, and sometimes people will do arithmetic Fabianus, and sometimes we'll do geometric Fabianus. But in either case, that's a Gawa element. And the geometric domain is just is a way of saying I'm using the inverse to the kind of obvious cube power domains. What special in characteristic P is that the geometric domain is not only the it's not only some Gawa element, the it's not only the inverse of Fabanius acting on here the action of the coefficients, has another interpretation, is an actual geometric morphism. So that's a kind of miracle fact about kind of the Gawa group in characteristic P is that. There's an actual and the the variety of FQ bar that achieves the same thing on cohomology as a Gal action. 
So, uh, and hence, that we can do these kind of countings. So, that, so, um, but so, but so, we, so we have to remember though that if if uh, arithmetic for Bayes, the kind of thing that raises algebraic numbers to the qth power, is acting as q on roots of unity, that means that the geometric for Bayes is acting as q inverse. Which means that if you do QL minus one, which is the inverse of the Kinkomi character, then your FQ is acting by Q. So that's where the Q comes from. And then it's good. We have zero, zero minus zero plus Q is the number of points on A1 over FQ. And so uh, so that's good. So that's kind of uh, some points counted. And so now I know I'm going through a lot of a lot of background, but this isn't method or reason for this madness. Which is that we want to um, count on points on some other things. What kind of things? Well, on Banji eventually, but so on some algebraic stacks. And these are going to be very interesting algebraic stacks. And they have like several features that make it kind of particularly tricky to count points on them. One is that they're not quasi compact. And being Essentially, what this means is that um, so if you're an affine variety of FQ, then uh, the number of FQ points you have will be fine. If you never prove this for yourself, you should sort of prove it. Um, but it's right. It's related to. Um, it's like related to saying that the number of. Uh, Kind of primes in Z bounded by n is finite. As, a, as essentially it's a kind of arithmetic statement about growth of primes in some kind of finite type of Q algebras. That if you bound the size of this, you feel that there's only finitely many primes. So one um, standard way to prove it is by net normalization and comparing with the net Um But so it, it is a true statement. And so then if you're a quasi compact scheme, or then you're covered by finitely many F fines, and so you'll have finitely many FQ. But when you're not quasi compact, as uh, these, these stacks are typically not, there's an infinite number of points. So counting them is, okay, that's already a problem in counting them. Like the question of what the answer is going to be. But the second issue is that a point in a stack is not a point. A point in an algebraic stack has a stabilizer. And really, what you have is a share. You have a point by global stabilizer group. And so you have to, so in some sense, that's what one would want to count as sort of the natural thing to count. It's certainly what in the Tamagawa question, that's what you want to count in the Tamagawa question. You want to count bundles weighted by the automorphisms. Um, so, uh, so we can think about a, um, a particular case. So when I was thinking about this, Seem to me good to um like before you want to count all the points in a variety, you want to know how to count like one point, at least so that the answer is one. And so before we count like all the points in our step, maybe you want to count like one share and just see what we get. And so we could take, for example, this share, point one G. So again, part of the subtlety is that I mean they're not the they I want to say they're the same phenomena, but they're very close, but they're not particularly different. They're very closely related. The kind of non quasi compactness is very related to being an Arkham stack that's not the lead master. And so the germs we're getting are not points modulo uh, finite groups, they're points modulo GM. So uh, one thing we can, um, so one thing you can note is that, oh, it looks like it came up in the in the code beam is that if you have a a, a micro stack and all the four with just finite stabilizer points and you're counting uh when you're doing doing cohomology with rational coefficients those finite stabilizers don't really affect the cohomology There's, you have kind of a covariant cohomology which is what the stacking cohomology will be and you have just sort of a naive cohomology of the say associated force moduli space and they will be the same with rational coefficients when you have finite stabilizers essentially because cohomology of finite groups and rational coefficients will vanish and so, um, so somehow stacking issues don't really matter for computing on the lean mountain stacks if you're doing the like kind of homologies. The, um, but the, as long as you're doing 
well coefficients, which is what we need to do to calculate. But but on the Alton stacks, stackiness will uh, will really matter. And so what sort of phenomenon do we see? Well, one thing is we see that this thing has dimension minus one. Zero divided by one dimension. So dimension minus one. So already kind of formulas like putting two D and this formula is not going to be kind of literally written in a correct way that makes sense on our side. And um, second thing is like how, what, how do we count? And so the way we're going to count things is we're going to just say, well, when we kind of look over FQ, we get one point whose automorphism group is GM over FQ. And so the, so the kind of actual physical automorphism over FQ are the FQ points of GM. And so we get to the final point with two minus one automorphisms. And so that's the number we need. And um, the second thing we can see is that superficially, that's not, for example, in this form. That is not, I mean, it is sort of, a little bit in this form. And so we could say this is y plus q is And we could do that. Yeah, it's minus that is. <laughs> yeah, so there's a there's overall of minus. So we could say that. And well, it's a little it's a little strange. Um slightly disconcerting. And well there's sort of a negative side, well, plain dimension minus one. Now it's minus one. I don't know how I kind of bothered by that. But there's kind of another, but it's definitely like one phenomenon is well, we can try and ask if this makes any sense at all, and we're going to see if that actually makes some sense. And then, but, the, but there's a basic issue, which is that this obviously doesn't converge, this suit. And so if you're going to start manipulating these expressions in an argument, it's going to be pretty painful if these are the expressions you have to manipulate. And why might you want to manipulate them? Because you might want to do things like this. In fact, as I said, our, our stack is not quasi compact. So it's going to be stratified by quasi-compact pieces. And so we might want to kind of make manipulations in the process of counting and matching things up. And if we're kind of manipulating convergent series, it's maybe not so bad. But if we're kind of manipulating divergent series, it's a little bit scary. And so, um, so, so, so this is sort of not going to be in some sense a final trace formula answer, but I want to also indicate why this is not a bad answer. We just have to massage it somehow. So why is this not a bad answer? Well, because what is the classifying space of GM? We're supposed to continue use topology. So we should say think of the complex numbers. And we have to remember topology is like a homotopical invariant. It's not, so we don't have to, um, so we, you know, we kind of have to, we have to think that way. And so we're doing um, sort of the, topologically we're doing the classifying space of C star, which is the classifying space of S1, which is a CP infinity. And the topology of CP infinity does have a class in every given degree. And so, in fact, this sort of looks like the limit of the PN computations, but kind of to even think of a degree, well, there's a sort of minus sign, which is a little bit uh, disturbing. But we can, um, but we can do the following thing. So, so let's sort of change this slide. So let me be divide by q to the minus one. So minus one is that dimension. And now let me just write the expression again. And so I get q over q minus one. It's one over one minus one over q. And that's one, one over q. And so that's an expression which is very similar to the previous one, but convergence, which is a kind of an advantage. And 
and has one over q's instead of q's. So actually, it sort of looks like all we need to do is somehow find a way to interpret our formula so we're allowed to have one over q's instead of q's, and then it's pretty good. And so how do we do that? Well, maybe I'll understand. Maybe uh, we can keep this. So I everything I mean, I mean. Some of some of some, you know some things I've written down are valid for not necessarily smooth varieties, but I'm only going to give our smooth thing that stack in question is smooth. And so for smooth varieties, we have Honkai duality. So this guy is equal to H to the minus I, where we could maybe call the dimension P usual cohomology. Except so if you pair hi and h2d minus i, you land in h2d of ql. And that's the fundamental class, which again, morally, all 2D dimensional manifolds share the same fundamental class. If you think about how they compute in algebraic quality, they come from something fundamentally, they come from local fundamental classes. And the fundamental class in dimension 2D is a default product of the fundamental class in degree 2. And we saw the fundamental class of degree two was this QL minus one, where for being attracted by Q. And so, so these pair not to QL, but to QL minus D, the default power of QL minus one. And so if we want to pair them to uh, QL, I should twist. So I should do this. And so that means that this sum, you can compute it as a sum of i equals zero to d of minus one to i. And so I have to kind of think about the adjoint. And so if you think about it, I'll get f2 inverse acting on h to d minus i, but somehow that just becomes, I mean, maybe I can call it j. And so if I call this j, the sum, Sum over the j's is the same ranges over the same ranges as sum over the i's. And, and this uh, this thing just multiplies the Fabanius eigenvalues by q to the d. So I can just kind of pull it out and put it out in front. And so, so about that board is yeah, it's actually being a curse since the very first bit is shorter. Yeah, it was even the worst one next door, but eventually, like, totally broke and then seemed to get repaired. Ah, uh, I don't know how that okay. okay. Well, I don't know if there's a way to get them repaired without breaking them entirely first. <laughs> I teach in this room, and I keep expecting it to like snap and break the slave yeah. So, basically, what we've just seen now. Kind of a reasonably proper assumption, and maybe U is now X, is we have the same formula, but here I have U the dimension of X. So I'm going to just take this formula, I have this Q to the D, I've pulled the Q over to the other side, and then I've written it again, so with U is now X, because that was all the the board, and so I have a new formula which works for not necessarily uh, proper varieties. And you can see it has this guy instead of FQ, and the bike's supposed to be happy with that. That means that if you have many terms here, you have a feeling that, well, if you like, you'll kind of in some sense know by the Bacon conjectures, sort of the, the size of the terms here will be uh, going down rather than going up. And then you can see that what we've um, written here is 
this same expression, the number of points divided by Q to the dimension for how I can stack. And so, in fact, that board will be a kind of validating sensation of this formula for stack as long as we kind of compute what the echo homologies are. But again, the idea was sort of that it was a C we were supposed to get a CP infinity. And so we should kind of get a class in every even degree. And we know how FQ acts on those classes. It acts by Q to the I in degree to I. And so FQ inverse will act by Q to the minus I. So in fact, I mean, it looks perfect. So one question is that how do you actually officially compute the ATOL homology of this acting stuff? So this is like a historically irritating question in some sense, because partly because the first answer was by some kind of well-known mathematician that they made fundamental mistakes that had to be kind of repaired. So it's kind of a bit of a sorry story. So I shouldn't dwell on it too much. But the um but certainly in um I mean, as I found by kind of uh, Googling, the, um, I think the kind of case story Louis manuscript does a treatment of atomic homology of Arkham stack essentially from nothing and kind of just gives it a natural definition, which kind of perfect sense. And I don't quite understand why people didn't do that to begin with, but maybe it's partly to do with, um, in general, like, I mean, in general, like, it's the same way one might define sort of like quite coherent sheaves on a stack nowadays is just you have quite coherent sheaves on an at time patch and you want to say that they should be kind of equivariant with respect to the group point. And with infinity categorical technology, that's easy to say. But in the old days, that was a hard to say. And so, probably again, infinity categorical language just makes it easier to kind of talk about the Latin homology of a stack straight up without having to go through weird second locutions. But, but the, the kind of re the reason they might be second locutions is because. Like if you have a domain Rumford stack, by definition, it has an ATOL cover by a scheme. And so then if you refine that, you get, so if you want to kind of compute its cohomology, the key thing is like the compute like with a like kind of very finite, you know, do a check computation, say on a very fine ATOL cover. So you could first certainly, first of all, at least go to a scheme and then ATOL cover that. So you're never really having to kind of do computations in an ATOL cover that doesn't involve just schemes. But if you have a stack that's not, the Lee Mumford, then by definition, if, of what Lee Mumford means, if this is not the Lee Mumford, as this isn't, it has no ATAL covered by schemes. So if you, so there's a, certainly a good notion of what it means to have an ATOM activist, but anything that has an ATOM activist will again be a non trivial stack. And so, um, so that's sort of, so in some sense, if you wanted to kind of compute your cohomology and have an, in, maybe in a small site, but have the objects in the small site be schemes, you couldn't have the morphisms also be a tal. And so that was, I think, the origin of the kind of initial confusion about how to define things. But I think, in fact, I mean, at least a preliminary investigation of this example, like last night when you know, talking to the end and this afternoon, so, so not a very extensive investigation, but a preliminary one suggests to me that it's fine to actually compute the ATAL homology using the small ATAL site, not just in the obvious method of stacks. And I think we can see how to do it in this case. So let me kind of give you a few computations of, of this thing. So, uh, so, one, so one sort of uh, topological way to compute homology of a classifying space is to just find something contractible that your variety acts on and freely and compute the homology of the contractible thing much below the free action, because that will actually now be in actual topological space. It has cohomology, and that should be the same as a point point of your group, and that's what we're trying to do. And so, um, well, we can take AN with its GM action just by scaling the variables. And AN is conjunctible, and GM is acting, and that's great. The, the action is not quite free, because zero is a fixed point. It's the only fixed point. So inside the have set a n minus zero is this gm action. And now you have a free action, but the thing is not quite conjectable. But we know it has cohomology only, I mean, it's topologically it's a 2n minus 1 sphere, and so it has this cohomology in degree 2n uh, minus 1. 
And so it's kind of highly connected. And as n gets larger, it's becoming more connected. And the um, quotient here, PM minus one. And so you see that PM minus one is a good approximation to uh, a point by GM, a kind of, it's kind of correct up to kind of something happening in some high degree of connectivity. And so, so that's the basic, yeah. So if I can have a topology class, you would like literally form S infinity and prove that's predictable or something slightly more sophisticated. But in, in some sense, you can think that kind of couple, as far as computing cohomology goes, a point mod, uh, GM is kind of is sort of CPU infinity. I think also literally in the sense of it's just the sort of things like that one space. I think that's also true. And so I think um a uh, a kind of another way to um but but maybe another way to compute this essentially from a definition is to think about like what are ethyl covers of this guy. And a basic ethyl cover of this thing will be uh, you would consider, yeah, well, we want to compute sort of a lighting homology, so I'll just think about the kind of these ethyl covers. I sort of have this map where the map here is like you raise to the ultimate nth power. So that's the kind of map of, so this is kind of something in the small ethyl side of this guy, this more specific ethyl. Thing. And now uh, we could ask, like, what is what is the kind of category? If we just sort of think about this object, what is the category? Well, this is the object. We have to think about its automorphisms. And so there'll be the automorphisms will be this mu L to the n. And so this um, so we have a kind of point with mu L to the n as a kind of a, some approximation to the actual small length outside of that thing. But the cohomology of a point mu L to the n say with coefficients in Z mod L to the N, was a simply group with kind of say, uh, constant coefficient cohomology. It's in even degrees. In inter and um, we get something in kind of implementing even degrees. And we can basically kind of let this L to the N go. And we, so we sort of have this idea that like, you kind of, to get kind of a circle with coefficient zero cohomology, you should take like cyclic groups with other characteristic cohomology and sort of take a limit. And the cyclic groups fill out the circle and the cohomology goes to characteristic zero. And so I think we can kind of check directly that the small length of site of this guy will compute the correct aligning cohomology, which will and you can sort of see that the um Cobanius by Q is kind of acting on I mean the the arithmetic Cobanius, which is FQ inverse, acts on this two uh, Q powers. So when you think about like homs from this guy to See my doctor to the end, you'll be modified dead by Q. So I think some of the numbers kind of seem to work out. So just to make sure I understand the, the L to the N map that you're saying on a test scheme, this will classify line bundles on each. And this is just the nth power of line bundle mapping in the correct direction. Like this will map. But well, this, 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 that this, this, is a, this is a thing where if you have kind of a point mapping, so you can think about this map, and then the you can think about sort of this layer map. So this will be so the power of will be mu out to the n. And so it's um so this is the uh thing that's sort of uh basically kind of extract you know extracting out to the end through to of a of a bundle. Well, I was just thinking here, but it turns out that there's like a map of groups instead of the map. So, um, so in any case, uh, to, to find a kind of precise definition of the, or to find a precise definition of the ACOM homology about stack, you can look in case for your Louis, but the upshot is it's going to be a typical thing where we, uh, we don't just use a, a small site, we use a kind of big site of all test schemes into our stack. And out of that big site, we just kind of organize the information to compute the comma. That's kind of works. So, uh, so I, I want to look at a few more examples of actually computing, and um, in particular, so I want to come back to this idea in a minute. So can I just ask? Oh, yeah. Maybe um, I'm actually confused about that minus sign earlier. 
like this explanation in terms of like the, you know, the, the sphere being intractable or whatever is very persuasive. So I just confused about where the. Well, I think somehow this, I mean, I think it's kind of going to be related to the fact that that's a kind of non convergent series and so the various information to be found. I, 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 I'm, not, I, I'm pretty sure that it's genuinely an example of how we would kind of keep manipulating with this derived applications. But I'm not 100% sure, but I feel like but I think you have to be have to be sort of pretty careful. Pretty careful. Because it's sort of, you have, but it's sort of about thinking like one over one minus x, and you can think about when x is less than one, or then if kind of x is greater than one, you can write this as one over one minus you know, like one over x minus one. So I can kind of write things this way, and now you get kind of basically close to kind of negative series one, which is a negative of the other. But they're kind of actually formulas for the same function in different regions, and so we're seeing that that's a phenomenon we're seeing. And so, it's, so, so then, the, then you kind of better not if you try to like add those sort of formulas together, you're treating a number of time in both regions, and you get contradictions. And it's sort of, so I think it's really that. Like sadly, like I think, <laughs> but I think sadly the kind of more naive computation is is truly like not so not so dumb. But, but it's sort of related to sort of again like things that don't converge. So you're kind of trying to asymptotically approach the value of the um of the trace. The like higher terms that you only uh, get as you go further and further along in some kind of telescopic construction are like at the dominant. So that's sort of not quite so somehow whereas you. So the reason we want to compute with this uh, other formula is now we reach. So we want to compute with a formula that has one of the cues is because now uh, high connectivity terms that you'll see only farther and farther along in some telephobic procedure are like bounded by one of the huge power of Q. And so actually they'll have a chance to kind of be negligible and kind of converge. So I think it. Yeah, I mean, I would like to have like, a better answer somehow, but didn't like a kind of cancer, but I think the kind of cancer is at least the first. May I ask a, a question? I was thinking of the answer at the end, but um, if one has a kind of equicharacteristic cohomology theory, then, then this would be converging on QL, but in Q. P or P. Well, then this would be like, and then and then the thing the actually converges on the nodes, like the original series, the yeah, yeah. series. Is there is there is there a formalism that actually makes sense of these divergent series by allowing the Q attic? Oh, sorry, or the yeah. Yeah. I think it's a little. Uh, I think that's a pretty uh, legitimate question, and I don't have a good answer. Ah, okay. Um, cool with their work, <laughs> and so 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 I want to um. Kind of, kind of, we have a break in just a few minutes. So I think I want to kind of give a few more examples of like this general, um, the kind of general like homology formalisms and computing stacks again with a focus on these very early cases. And then when we come back after the break, we'll do we'll do bunch. But, uh, but, but so we can first of all think about something like a one modulo. We found those things. And so we could kind of, and, and then we probably want to divide by Q to the dimension. But the dimension here is one minus one, which is zero. So, 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 so there's not any division actually needed, but it's good to remember that we should have done it. Yeah. So, great. But so, um, so we just count these points. Well, we get kind of Q. Over Q minus one. So we just say that Q plus A1 and there are some points of the automorphisms. But there's another way we could kind of compute this. Because A mod GM sits in a picture like the one up on that board. We have a point mod GM sitting here. And we have GM mod GM, which is actually just a point. I know it's it was close. And so so somehow the counts should match. And so here we get, oh, again, the, the dimension part is going away. So here's the Q over Q minus one. And here we get, well, so we could write that as Q minus one over Q minus one plus one over Q minus one. So that's really done. Get away okay, so one over Q minus one plus one over Q minus one, which is one over Q minus one plus one. So there's one point, and there's zero. 
So, so good. So like sort of our, I mean, sort of had to work out, but I mean, we're just counting points again, but somehow it's just good to check that sort of some point counts behaved well with respect to decomposing our stack. But, this, and again, but again, it's not supposed to be mysterious because I'm just uh, counting things by sort of um, automorphisms and so on. So it all sort of had to work out. Again, just because of the behavior of automorphisms and 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 subtlety of whether you're like exactly how kosher it is to interchange the FQ with the quotient, which again I don't really want to get into too much. Um, because of that, like checking the validity validity of such a formula is like marginally more complicated than um, the case of just breaking a schema into two pieces. But we should think of it as being on the same level. But essentially, we're counting points if we just physically decompose our space into two halves. We should just be able to count what's in each half and add them up. But you can think about what happens cohomologically. Because cohomologically, uh, again, we have kind of something closed and something open. And you know, cohomology is not exactly, I mean, it doesn't just decompose. So in the in the kind of previous uh, version of the less chips chance formula, where we had compact and supported cohomology. We kind of saw how they came about because we had, um, because in um, we we so in the previous thing we kind of saw there was kind of a governing short of that sequence that sort of who which we went which you went in you took our gamma of this you kind of got the cohomologies that could have governed how to count points here, but now we have a version where we want the answer on U as well as on X to be the usual cohomology. So that means I don't want to um, think about, uh, so I don't want to have J lower streaks. So if you want to kind of think about usual cohomology, we could have QL here. And then we have an adjunction map for the R J lower star of QL. And if you R gamma this, you'll get the cohomology of X. And if you R gamma this, you're, R gamma ring and drive push forwards, you're just getting the R gamma on U, and that'll give you the cohomology of U. And so then the kind of trace here will compute the cohomology of X, and a trace here will compute the cohomology of U. But then, but now the map goes this way, and the distinguished triangle have a kernel, and that's sections which vanish when you restrict them to U. So those are sections supported on Y. So that's the. Um, uh, the well, Again, I mean, how to derive. So I don't know if people, if people write it this way or in more actually things they write with like script, script page Y, so the kind of sheet version of local cohomology, or or they write it as kind of oh, maybe they probably have other things too, but those are some standard notations. So this is a guide in which when you compute, you get uh, the local cohomology along line. And so what we find is that if we kind of do our formula, we get uh, Q to the, so let's say that X again has dimension D, and so U has dimension D, and let's say here we have co-dimension C. And so we'll get, Let me omit the coefficients because they always do well. So, so this cohomology, that's sort of the trace computed E will be, well, this Q to the D is just going to come along for the right. It's just, we're kind of going to like do a, you know, additivity of kind of trace computations in, in distinguished triangles. And then we'll just multiply that formula by Q to the D. So we get some of a minus one to the I, the trace that Q inverse on the cohomology of U. So great. So the points, the point count for x is the point count for u. And then there should be another term, which is the point count for y. But let's see what the term actually is. So the term that we actually get is q to the d times the sum of minus one to the i trace of f to inverse on the local cohomology along y of x. So that's the actual thing we get just by the very nature of formulas and the uh 
and the thing we want. So we see that this is, this kind of is a number of points on X, and this is the number of points on U. So this must be the number of points on Y, but the number of points on Y, according to formulas, is the sum from minus to zero to two times B minus E, because that's the dimension of Y, and minus one to the I times the trace and uh, so a u to the d minus c here yeah, times the trace of the inverse on h i and y. And so, so somehow this guy, I mean, is counting the number of points in f q that are not in u. So this must be counting the number of points in y. So there must be some reason that it matches up with this formula. And so there is a reason. And so the reason is that We'll call like so again. Why should everything should be smooth? Right? So why should it be smooth? Because I'm doing somewhere along the way I use plurality, and so um, we we'll call that when you want to compute the local cohomology of uh, y and x, local cohomology is that's the algebraic geometry version of excision. So you can replace the ambient x by just a tubular neighborhood of y, and so you're kind of really computing uh, the local cohomology of y in a tubular neighborhood, and so essentially it's just it's again like fundamental class. It's like uh, you know the fundamental class, like the commodity of, a, of the, the the fundamental class of a two manifold comes about because fundamentally a point has commodity degree zero, but somehow you like now do a disk minus a point and that degree zero class gets moved somewhere else, and then you're gluing this into kind of a room steps, and they end up being in degree two. And so so this and I think algebraic topologists have all these words like gizen and where I mean there seem to be like this. Oh, there's really like a bunch of different names more or less attached to the same idea. Um, but I think in uh, growth induced school, it's also called the purity for local cohomology. And um, so the local cohomology of X along Y in uh, with the I plus two times the dimension will be cohomology of Y. With a twist by minus two dimension, and so uh, so here we get contributions. But, but so one thing we can notice is that the two C is even, so it doesn't affect the sum. And other, and then so then that shift is kind of irrelevant because the sign is unchanging. But we sort of see that uh, here. Here we get the eight, we get H I with the twist by minus C. But then when we compute the Frobenius of cube inverse, that gives us a Q to the minus C. So we get so, so somehow the twist ends up giving us this formula plus this is this. And so we see that once we know how to compute local cohomology, we can kind of reconcile the cohomological kind of expressions with the kind of naive just having things in two pieces, which is good. Otherwise, it'd be contradictions in math, and we wouldn't know what we were doing. So it's good to like at least momentarily know what we're doing. So I think um, there's uh, there's perhaps one last computation I want to write down as an example, and then uh, and then we'll take a break. And so the very last computation I wanted to write down as an example was point one a one because a one I mean topologically is a complex line, it's contractible. And so this should have trivial cohomology. Um, and uh, but how could we um, how could we compute it? Well, sorry, I have something momentarily like cryptic written on my, I think it's all good. So I have, um, just to clarify, when you say like a point Monday, what do you mean like a point the same large as like GA? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I can write GA probably better than the point one GA. And so so I can divide by the dimension, which is q to the minus one. And if I just compute it, I get one over the q, because that's how many FQ points in our GA over one over q, which is one. And that is at least the same point count that if you count at a single point. So that's that's convincing. <laughs> and uh 
But we could also notice that, for example, morally, we could replace this point by anything else contractible. So we could do like A1 by GA, and then we would literally get a point. And, and it all works out. I mean, you know, we would have got it the same number. So, for example, you kind of see this formula, like you'll get sort of compensating uh, expressions for dimensions and so on if you, if you kind of change things around. If you do like A1 and 1 GA, then sort of uh, then this goes away and we just get the next one. But so I think, um, so, so yeah, so, so one thing, so maybe that's a kind of a good thing to note is that the um, dimension of the stack is not a topological invariant or not a homotopical invariant, like a point mod GA and A1 mod GA somehow homotopically should be the same. It's like one has dimension minus one, one has dimension zero. So that's another reason why, in some sense, this quantity is a better one to be thinking about as being computed by homology. Well, it's not, it's not a topological invariant either, is it? I mean, a d dimensional vector space is contractible. So. This is true. Um, of course, this is true. But it kind of means that, um, kind of in this expression, when you put this kind of, uh, right, who knows what it means? But yes, but it sort of, <laughs> But something, I mean, I think, I mean, I think I'm still a bit kind of, uh, there's something intriguing that somehow we write cohomology, but the thing that we put in sort of has this, has this kind of contribution that's not kind of purely like homotopical. So there's something kind of funny happening and this will help us later. So we'll take a break and then uh, I'll try to do some sort of evidence and then we'll, we'll Yes. So, uh, onward to, to band G. So, for hero. Uh, so, so one wants to um, apply this theorem, uh, or this idea of the theorem, the kind of a formalism, to and show that it kind of works for band G in the sense that the, um, so again, the kind of cohomologies of bungee defined by some general setup. And so we have, so, so the kind of expression where we sum over, you know, trace of well, Q inverse on the commodities, that's an expression that can be written down. And then also the point counts the thing that can be written down. And the claim is that they kind of both converge and are equal. And that's what I want to do um, at least sketch. I'm certainly it's going to be nothing more than a sketch. And so, uh, so, um, Jacob already kind of notes in his, in his lecture that uh, for general G, say if G is like not a constant group over X, but sort of really varying over X, there'll be kind of extra subtleties. I'm actually not going to engage with those. And honestly, like the, for me, G is momentarily going to be SLM, but then very quickly going to be SL2. I think SL2 already illustrates the key examples. Um, and it's easier to kind of give some concrete, uh, show the concrete phenomenon. Um, there's some, um, so now X will be a, a smooth, objective, symmetrically connected curve over Q. There's the G. And then we're going to be thinking a lot about bundles over E. Maybe this bundle has rank N. So one thing that's kind of useful to remember is the Euler characteristic of E by Raymond Rock is equal to the degree of E, which is defined to be the degree of its uh, first chunk class, or equivalently, you take the top exterior of power, which is a line bundle, it's the degree of that line bundle, plus the rank of E times one minus G. So that's the last theorem. And you can um, certainly apply this so, so if you um, wanted to know what the, what the dimension of a, uh, you wanted to understand Banji, I mean, basically all kind of, def, say, dimensional smoothness, like, I mean, all deformation theories are always basically governed by a complex of cohomologies. And it's roughly like, some low degree one is going to be automorphism, to the next one is going to be tangent space, and the next one is going to be abstractions, in which ones they are, you have to kind of just keep straight away where you're living what you're doing. But in the case of modular bundles, the relevant thing you take cohomology of is the adjoint bundle. And H naught gives you in all of endomorphisms, which is infinitesimal automorphisms. And H1 gives you the tangent space. 
and H2 gives you the obstructions, but we're on a curve, there's no H2. So there are no obstructions, so forget we'll bind G is smooth. And if you're doing bind SLM, so what is SLM? So that means you're looking at random bundles whose the permanent is trivialized. So there's a fixed identification of the public theory of power with the trivial bundle. And when you do deformations, you want to maintain that property. So it means you don't use the adjoint, you use the traceless adjoint to add zero. Is what number two is called, at least. So that's the, instead of uh, looking at the matrix, if matrix is you know, the animal, you'll get a traceless in case you're in it. And so, um, and then again, sort of the uh, H1 is a sort of a tandem space dimension, and the H0 is the infinitesimal automorphism. So that's the Lie algebra of the stabilizer. And so that's going to tell us the dimension of the stabilizer. I'll look at the dimension of the Lie algebra. And the tandem space is going to tell us sort of the dimension of like a scheme chart. And so the difference of these two is going to tell us the actual dimension of the stack. So we compute H1, uh, H0, right? H1 minus H0, which is the negative of the other characters. And so we know that the dimension of ban SLN of X will be the negative of the other characteristic of the traceless adjoint of E. And E has rank N, so this has rank N squared minus one. And so we get, well, but, but this E we're assuming has uh, the top exterior power is trivial. So the degree is going to be zero. And so there's no degree contribution. And so uh, we get the rank of the adjoint is n squared minus one times, and there's a negative sign, so it's g minus one. And so that's the dimension of SLN times g minus one. So that's kind of the formula for the dimension as you should have been talked about before. So, um, so that's the thing we'd like to try and compute. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, that's, this is, uh, that has, the one, the one has this dimension. But what we're going to see is it has a, uh, a lot of strata. And so in fact, I'm going to um, specialize to a very complete and very particular case. So I'm going to think about n equals two and gen is one. Please illustrate the key ideas. Aaron's mouth, well, because we discussed famous paper of Atiyah about this kind of topic not long ago. So there's a beautiful paper of Atiyah about uh, vector bundle and Olympic curves, which more or less introduces basic techniques of working with vector bundles on curves, which is saturating them with like line bundles and filtering by line bundles, using human rock to help compute things. And uh, and so, um, so I'm going to certainly, I was reading this last night to turn my notes and we'll be using this. Uh, so, what we see now is that in this case, so the dimension of band of two of x is uh, zero. So, so I mean, genus one has a convenient feature that uh, g minus one is zero, so it makes some numbers simpler to write on the board. Um, but uh, so it's a curious thing. This is going to be a stack with an infinite number of points to the dimension of zero. So. We have to, it's good to try to understand what the hell's going on. How could, how could this be? And so, for example, uh, well, what kind of rank two bundles could we have? They could be a Jackson of line bundles, or they could be in decomposing, which is to say, not a Jackson of line bundles. But again, we're looking at things that have a sort of trivial, you know, trivialized uh, top cohomology. And so, so it's also hard to see, for example, suppose you have. Suppose you have a, a, an E with a, whose top cohomology is trivial, you could twist it by a degree one line bundle. And now you will get something whose top, whose exterior square had degree two. And then you would look at the formula and you see that the Euler characteristic of your thing is two. And so the H naught is at least two. And so you so you'd have a rank two bundle of degree two, which had a two-dimensional space of sections. And so what would those sections be? They would uh, either kind of, I mean, you can kind of think about kind of how they map in, and they would either like map in nearly independently, 
sort of, and give you, and then when you saturate them, you would write your twisted bundle of the direct sum of two line bundles, and you would twist packet with the direct sum of two line bundles. Or they would end up mapping in not sort of not linearly independently, and then you produce a subline bundle in your in your twisted vector bundle. But the subline bundle has at least two sections. So that kind of forces its degree to be at least two on the Olympic curve. And so then when you twist back, you find that you um uh I'm myself on totally model. But yeah, sorry, I have myself. You, you just, I should say you will discover it has, I mean, I'm not all about degrees, but we discover that when we twist back, I mean, either we have some two line bundles or when you twist back, you discover you're an extension of um, to a trivial bundle by itself. You, you discover your extension of a degree zero bundle by a degree zero bundle. And, uh, and then the, the, the determinant has to be trivial. So they have to be kind of mutual inverse to each other, but the, um, on the other hand, if you're, if you're in decomposable, the H1 has to be non-zero, so that means some H1 has to be non-zero, and H1 of degree zero bundles and all the curves tends to be zero, unless it's the trivial bundle itself, in which case the H0 and H1 are both one. If it's a non-trivial degree zero bundle, the H0 and H1 are both zero. So you, so you discover that the one sort of called the indecomposable bundles are... Uh, well, the H1 of O is one dimensional, so that's the unique non split extension of O by O. So you have that extension. And then you could twist it by a, a square root of the, of the trivial bundle, which is. Um, to be careful about that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so so you can, if we, we can kind of twist by something whose square is whose sense of square is O, because then uh, then then this gives us something indecomposable with the sort of trivial uh, wedge square, and that's sort of the only indecomposable case. And then, then we can think about uh, decomposable, the way you're sum of two line bundles. And, and again, since your interior square has to be zero, you are uh, you have to be a sum of line bundles that's inverse. And we can think about um, the situation where uh, b equals zero, or kind of where or things then you have the case where d is positive. But again, but when uh, well, I'm going to kind of compute some some gerbs and some dimensions in just a minute. But what I so maybe I'll maybe now. So so let's think about what are the harms from this guy to this guy. So the most interesting thing is that the harm from the O, which is a quotient, into the O, which is a sub. And that's in your potent endomorphism. If you do it twice, you it's like you go from the top to the bottom, then you disappear into the ground. And so um so if you add one to that. You get uh, auto, you get unipotent automorphisms. So there's kind of a copy of GA in the automorphisms. And then you could also just kind of try to scale without uh, shifting. But you sort of have not good extensions. So if you kind of scale kind of the bottom O, you have to scale the top O by, on the one hand, the same scalar because the extensions are split. But by the other, on the other hand, by the inverse scalar, because the exterior power is fixed to be trivial, and you can't change that by anything. And so you kind of so so if the same scale is equal to its inverse, that scalar is plus or minus one. And so we find that the automorphisms are equal to mu two plus a ga plus a ga. And so that means that as a point in our stack, this gerb, you have this point so that module these automorphisms to one dimensional. So you get a point of dimension minus one. So what about so that's a disconnected state question? Yeah. But we can kind of see where it comes from in just a sec, actually. Um 
But the automotive development is Olympus. So let's say E. Well, assume, assume L tends to be not equal to zero, but, but L has the, the, the degree is equal to zero. So this D means the degree of the L, the D, 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 the degree of the L. Now we're assuming that, you know, in the degree zero case. So then we can uh, scale L, and there's a GM that automorphs L to itself. And then since you want to preserve the identification of L tends to L inverse with O, you'll have to kind of act on the L inverse by the inverse non zero element. So you kind of have a GM kind of acting by like lambda, kind of lambda inverse. And then the, but then what other homs are there? Well, to give a home from L to L inverse is to give a global section of L to the minus two or L to the two. But those are degree zero and assumed to be non trivial. So they have no section. So there are no cross terms. And so, um, so this is the order model. And so, uh, so also dimension, each point is again dimension minus one. But we can see these kind of form a family because we let this L vary. So, so at first you think that what you're drawing is kind of a copy of the Picard, you know, a copy of the Pic zero. Except you notice that actually like L and L inverse give you the same answer. So what we really have is sort of Pic of uh, pick zero of X, which is sort of just X itself. So that's kind of simple, we've got X itself, so we'll go minus important points. Modulo action plus minus one. So that's a P1 with four points of function. And then sort of at least, let me put this part slightly in quotes because I didn't think that we um, there's, I mean, I, I just didn't think through whether we had whether this was literally uh, this question by GM or some slight, something slightly more jerry, but it's essential. And it's probably not hard, but I just didn't think about it. And I had the board on it, not the other topic, but it's, um, but it's essentially a kind of function P1 minus a GM. So it's sort of zero dimensional, that's out of zero dimensions. So there are zero dimensions. So there's essentially a kind of one dimensional family. We kind of vary these L's, but, but sort of each one has a one dimensional stabilizer. So it's a kind of a one So basically that's roughly what this bun SL2 looks like. That roughly looks like a one dimensional family, but each every point we test sort of dimension minus one. And that's sort of why the number is a zero, so to speak. But, and we also sort of see, well, what happens as you come to these points? Well, they're fixed by plus minus one. So it's a typical situation. Now, plus minus one must be acting as automorphisms of the object there. And so then you get to these points where you have um, the mu two. So that's kind of like plus minus one. And then the GM is also there. So, uh, so, so the GA, rather the GM kind of degenerates, somehow converts into a GA. So there's some sort of, so of course, we could, one could write down this curve, we try to compute exactly what happens. But, you can kind of get a feeling of what happens just by, by what I said. So, um, but, so then, uh, but, um, but when you limit to these points, so these are going to be the more generic, so when you kind of look at this family and you kind of go to these points, these objects are going to be the more generic limit because they still dimension minus one, but there are some other more degenerate limits you could take. For example, these points themselves can specialize to a non-split extension, to a split extension. So, so that's, but, but those points are kind of in the closure of those points, and those, those points are kind of in the closure of this setup, but these are like more generic in the closure than the other points. The other points look weirder, because if you have elements of two is trivial, then the automorphisms L plus L inverse, well, this is just L plus L, so it's all the vessel two. So those are co-dimension, those, those are dimension minus three. So they're quite a bit more, more kind of special. Um, and so and now that's the kind of the beginning of a story of kind of randomly bad point states. So somehow the 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 kind of so if we were to talk to like you know five students probably or like people. You know, 
classical comments out of range geometry, probably an Irish statement when he was like, oh, colleague, he didn't what he said, he passed, and so on. We would find that when people thought about sort of, oh, basically people who are not in the geometric Flatlands program, essentially, when people talk about kind of bungee, they, when they don't say bungee, they have some other words, and they really mean like semi-stable bundles or some sort of reasonable part where you have reasonable kind of topology and cohology. And in our kind of context, that will be this P1. Like this P1 with a possible like multiple interpretation of what happens at these special points. Like there's kind of the non fluid extension and then the direct sum and which bundle is better or kind of debated. But essentially this P1 will be like what will be what kind of the bind XL2 of our Olympic curve is. But in our world where we allow all possible bundles, there are other kind of sort of worse objects. And so one, so they will be L plus on the inverses where the degree of L is greater than zero. So one saving grace of these is at least then L, if L has positive degree, L inverse has negative degree, and they're not isomorphic. So uh, we don't get identifications. So that so we don't have to kind of break up into any any different you know cases. So that's the, the one one good thing about them, but it's one of the few good traits. Um, but they, in particular, these are guys which have degree zero, but they have a positive degree subbundle, so they're kind of essentially by definition not semi stable. So these are things that you would throw away if you were sort of not basically doing even and so um, so we can try to compute the order of physics. And so again, we could scale L. We could scale the basic vector G. Then we could scale so this by compensating inverse scalar. And so we get a G out. But then we could look at cross terms. So comes from L to L inverse are things in H0 of L to the minus 2. And that's H0 of something negative. So there are no such cross terms. But Holmes from L inverse to L are H0 of L tensor 2, and that's positive degree. In fact, L tensor 2 has degree 2D. And so we can kind of go back to our formulas, our even rock, and we can say that, well, uh, it's a positive degree bundle on the curve, so the H1 will be 0. So all the actually will come from H0. And it's um, 2D. And so we get sort of something unipotent dimension 2D. So the same, the same classic behavior happens where the deeper you go down in the stratification, the more yeah. unipotent or yeah. solvable or dealing And um, And let me write a formula that also works for general G because it's a bit kind of a gives it a bit more of a punchline at the end. But sort of for general G, like sort of understanding what the H1 and H0 are of this kind of degree 2D thing is a bit subtle if D is not too big. But eventually, if D is big enough, I mean, if D is big, you know, equal to the genus, say, then um, then again, the H1 in Newman drop will go away and, and you'll just have the same sort of function. So, so we have these points. And so um, place. Uh, good. So what does this locus look like? Well, we have to choose this line bundle, positive degree. There's no now, this guy is negative degree. So there's no confusion of which one is a positive degree. So we're really just choosing a line. Bundle. So we're really just looking at the of x. But our line bundle is sort of a uh, kind of modulo. Again, this is sort of roughly. I mean, the zero group is not a constant thing because I, you know, it's, 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 this is the H zero of some like L tensor two, which depends on, on the, the same dimension as the L variance, but they're not literally the same vector space. But it's sort of morally, 
it's uh kind of looks like this. So basically like the PA to the spot minus G. That's essentially what we have. And so um And so, uh, for example, this has dimension. Well, we have G for the Picard in a given degree. And then we have to subtract minus one. And then we have to subtract to the one minus G. So we get three times G minus one minus two. So, very negative dimension. And so we need to, um, so, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to, uh, show that our, um, we're trying to show that we can kind of count points about chase formula and that it all kind of makes sense. So the, um, so the first thing that's going to happen is that, and again, I'm going to be a little bit careful because it's going to be a, a not, not a finite not a finite certification, but we can satisfy our bond G by there's all of bond G, and then we can kind of look at the kind of part where D is at least one, and then the part sub part where D is at least two, and so on, until we get into a certification by higher and higher codimension closed sets, and so we can um, kind of generalize the computation which by Y and my U that I had on these boards to uh, see that the kind of the, the kind of trace computation for the cohomology of bound G could be broken up and unit as a sum of trace computations on the various uh, pieces. And the, um, so, sorry, now. So, so what, yeah, so what is it trying to do? So let's sort of see the contribution to the point. So again, in terms of this count, because they're trying to again show that that's, that expression kind of converges and it equals some other phase one. So let's think about the contribution to the point count. So uh, we're counting these points. And here's sort of the number of automorphisms. So it's basically, what do we get? We get sort of a, So we're so we're so we're counting one kind of point for each line bundle. But if we were just do, if we were just doing the Picard, each line bundle on, on the on the kind of Picard stack, which is sort of the Picard scheme by GM, we just had the kind of GM as automorphisms. So we will so we will, so we get this point, so we will get this point out. But now we have more automorphisms. But the number of autom extra automorphisms we have isn't changing. I mean it's constant across all the points. So the point count we get here is a point count. With this guy, but with some other massive uh, compensating thing coming from this unipotent part. So we get an X to Q to the G of one minus G, or this kind of huge X to GA. So, by the way, that's kind of good. There's an infinite number of this chart, and they kind of adding to our point count, and we want to see that we get convergence. So, notice that this is just some number, whatever it is. And then it's kind of times this thing that's kind of like a geometric series as, as B gets. So that's great. So therefore the point count. You know, someone's on mute around a question. Um, <laughs> so, so we're ready. Ready to show us the point count convergence. Because again, we have the stuff from the P1, the, we have the reasonable semi stable kind of stuff, and so that's just the quite the compact thing. So there's no quite a many counting points in adding them up there. 
and then we have kind of all this other strata, but, but the numbers you get are whatever this is divided by this big power of Q that's growing as D grows. So the, so the point count is different. So, um, so that's good. So now we have to kind of think about the uh, trace from your part. And so, uh, it gives long contribution. Um, if I live, uh, So we get um so so we to sort of remind you that the, the setup was that the trace that, that when you when you sum the trace you get the points divided divided by q to the dimension. And so um and so uh so from our so so I'll try and write down what we get. We get we get the trace from the inverse on the H I of our each stratum, but with some kind of power of Q. So let's just remember what the power of Q is. And so the power of Q is uh, um, what is the uh, single homology? So it is uh, this guy. Sorry, I had to record this before. Not talking about the denominator there, but the two D plus one minus G. Yeah, I wonder one, um, sorry, I just want to, I just I gave myself a piece to make sure that I have the correct thing. So it should be U to the tournament. Uh, Q to the minus. All right, so that's sort of the, so, so we kind of write down the, uh, some of the um, traces. Post application and so you, so that decomposes according to a sum of the open strata and the various post strata, but each post strata doesn't just con contribute its trace, it kind of computes its trace contribution with this kind of extra weight. And so, uh, um, and so this thing, as we look at our third dimension. This thing is also going like you the 2D. So that third dimension, in that dimension, so so we had our dimension for SL2 is three times G minus one. And so uh, our third dimension is like, well, G minus we, we went from three D minus one to two D minus one, so there's a G minus one, and then we also we lost two D more. So it's kind of G minus one minus two D, but so the key thing is there's like a Q to the two D. And so so, the, so there's some weighting factors here. And I, I'm I'm uh, I'm worried about the signs, but certainly in the end it's gonna be a minus sign. Yeah, minus codimension. The codimension is like a two D, so it's equal to minus two D. So so certainly this expression is kind of weighted by a decreasing power of Q, which is again, I mean it's not surprisingly kind of Analogous to this. I mean, I could, we could literally put, kind of, we could literally, literally put that formula. So one minus g minus, by two times uh, one minus two, so one times one minus three minus two d, and that's um, that's kind of the same thing here. So then the question is, what happens with this? 
So, so what we're seeing, so what we see is that again, we see that by counting points and counting them kind of start and by starting. And, and again, for small d, it doesn't matter how we organize the information because if you should, if you go up any given d, that's quite compact and you can just count the points however you like and trace them however you like. But the key thing is if you kind of look at large d where we have this very kind of systematic behavior, then which is which is just d greater than zero within the curve case, it may be larger than the general case, we see that the kind of points in this strata, and when we count them, we get some fixed. On a given strata, the number we get is some, some fixed quantity divided by this power q, and so that expression really converges. And then what we see is that when we can do the corresponding trace computation, we get uh, we we don't try to evaluate it directly, but we use the stratification idea to kind of describe that trace sum as a itself a kind of infinite sum of trace sums for all these strata, and each of those looks like this. And so that looks really good because, again, we get uh, the same kind of power of Q just decreasing. And then we get this thing. And so we need this to be kind of controlled. So we need this to kind of be somehow uniformly controlled to get convergence. But actually, we want everything to match. We, want, well, we, we don't really want the two sides to converge. We want them to coincide. So what would be nice will be if this kind of actually kind of matched this. But, but it does. <laughs> and the reason is because when we compute the cohomology, we already saw a point point A1 doesn't is contractible, had no cohomology. And so here is a, a, a you know, point one GA, no cohomology. And here's GA to a power. So having these GAs doesn't change the cohomology. So the cohomology here, you can just, the cohomology you get is the same as you did have PP mod GM, which is what we had. So you actually get the same. Uh, so, so we like these quantities are independent of the D. And so, so kind of on both sides, the point count side and the trace side, we're kind of we've kind of they already infinite sums in cohomology. We've introduced another infinite sum over this D, but then we've shown that term by term those things literally match, and they. Actually, independent of D, except for some weight in Q to the 2D, which is luckily a one over Q to the 2D. So we get convergence. So both sides, so we kind of get in two convergent series of literally matching count. And so we've proved that the trace computation equals the point count, which is our job. We're done. Great. <laughs> Sort of a question in the in the P one case, which I finally did manage to work out. It took me a little longer than expected, but um, when you actually do multiply, when you have to compute this ratio function, um, yeah. you basically get uh, what is it? It's, it's for, for P one for the um, it's it's an SL two. You actually get the zeta function of two evaluated mm -hmm. in two. And do you get a similar sort of deal where you will get the zeta function the elliptic curve? I mean, do you actually know off the top of your head what, what the Tamagawa number becomes as a special value of zeta here? Or good question. Uh, I mean, so I definitely the answer is uh, is no. Um, but we certainly have some information to try and compute it. But uh, but I don't. Um, yeah, but I don't know what the answer is off the top of my head. I have to confess that. It would be something like a zeta function at a special value or something like that. But well, you kind of. Uh, well, product of zeta function. I'm not. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I sort of. I mean, certainly, like you see that sort of for these B's, you're just getting kind of the Jacobi is just giving you the zeta function of x, and then they're kind of with these, uh, with these kind of due to the two D's. But the um, that all looks very good, but but I don't know what happens in the kind of semi-stable picture. Like in general, like I'm, not, I'm not just quite sure what's happening here. Like like in this particular Luby curve case, you kind of got like the Luby curve minus twenty one two, so we kind of got this P one. But I don't actually have a, know what the generalization of that is. So I have to confess, I never having computed any fine G ever before preparing this talk last night. So uh, and, and and the few examples I gave in my course. So I sort of. 
So I don't, so I don't. The, the, the product formula in that case yes. actually becomes the product formula for zeta yeah. function on the one yes. side and the rational yeah. function when you add these things up on the other. So it, I mean, they must. Um, yeah, so that, so one should, uh, yeah, one should try to, to probably kind of think that through and figure out what's, what's happening in general. The, um, but yeah, not, um, so, uh, yeah, so probably you talked about like the classical Demogawa number formulas, like equivalent to these sort of formulas, like writing the volume of it, like vol writing the volume of like the kind of derivative of the Z and the kind of like the this is the first lecture. Yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. No, it's a it's exercise for the audience. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.